Hello everybody. In this video, I'm gonna be showing you how to use a jointer properly so that you don't mash up your work and also safely so that you don't mash up your fingers. Let's get going. So the machine I'm using here is the Axminster AT129PT, which is a combination of a jointer on top and a thicknesser underneath. Now, before watching this video, if you don't know the difference between a jointer and a thicknesser, you need to make sure you watch my previous video, link is in the top corner, which will explain the difference between the two machines and why it is important to own both of them. If you have already watched that video, there's gonna be a few things that I repeat in this, but there's gonna be a lot of new things as well. So at first glance, this machine is pretty easy to understand how it works. Got the in-feed table here, and all we're doing is pushing the wood over the cutter block and making it flat on this bottom face here. And then if you want to get an edge square to that, we've got a fence on the back here that you can run the timber up against and you can get one edge square to that flat face. You can't do the opposite edge because that is what I explained in my previous video. So firstly, let's look at the guard, and these vary from different manufacturers. Some of them cover the entire cutter block, and in order to expose the cutter block, you push the wood into it, and the guard pivots out the way, and you carry on sending the board through, and then once it's passed, the guard moves back over the cutter block automatically. Other machines are manual, like this, so we've got a rise and fall here, that I can adjust like that, and I can also move the guard in and out as well, and I've got this one here, which tilts it forwards and backwards. So depending on the height of this arm, you can also adjust it to match it. So when setting the guards on these machines, you want as little of that cutter exposed as possible. So if I was to put a section like this through, not only have I got a lot of space up above the guard there, but I've got a lot of space to the right-hand side of it as well. So what we're gonna do is lower that down so that only the material can pass through that. My fingers, can't get under that whatsoever. I do have this back edge here. That is what I can use the tilt for. So by the time the material's through, a bit lower than that. There you go. So now only the material can get under there. There's no way my fingers can get under there unless they slip off the side and they go under this bit. So that's why you move the guard to the side like this and you can shift the back fence forward like that. So now we've got very little of that cutter exposed and it's gonna be difficult to get your fingers in there and turn them into mincemeat. And you'll see on the back edge here, as you slide that fence forwards and backwards, you usually have a long arm here that covers all the cutter block here as well. So you can't get your finger under there whatsoever either. The other advantage to having the fence close to the front of the machine like this is when it comes to jointing that edge on there, you can move this guard out of the way and then we'll just lower it down so it covers the cutter block. And now you can see the fence is right there in front of me. Whereas if it was at the back of the machine and the guard moved all the way back, of course, you're sort of leaning over the machine and you've got a lot of pressure on this back fence. And if you're working with a wider machine, you're gonna be very off balance, especially when you get to the opposite edge here because you're leaning right over that cutter block. By shifting it all forwards, towards you, it is right there at your hips and you can easily send it through, no problems whatsoever. So some of these machines are sold with these push block things. And these allow you to grip the timber nicely and push it through like that. So then your fingers are away from the cutter block, you've got good grip on the timber. They're good for people who aren't particularly confident with this machine. The only thing I would say, do not get a push block like this. The reason being, you can probably see, yeah, what, what are you gonna do? Like you could try and arc it over like that. These really are not good for planers because what it encourages you to do is move this out of the way and then you've got loads of the cutter block exposed there and you're sending it through like that. But safety isn't the only problem with using a push block like this. Another thing that these push blocks tend to do is make your timber extremely bowed. So I've fully isolated the machine so it's not gonna turn on unexpectedly or anything. So you can see on this bit of timber here, we've got quite a considerable bow going on. So what we want to do with this is obviously take material off this end here and this end here. What we don't want to do is take off an even amount of material along that entire length because we're gonna make this thinner, but it's not gonna get rid of that bow whatsoever because it's taking off an even amount along its length. That is exactly what this does. If you're gonna press it down in the middle, you actually just end up pressing that bow out of it, sending it over the cutter block, and then as soon as you get to the other side, it springs back up into the same position. Like yes, you're cleaning up this bottom face on the board, but there's still that internal tension in there which is gonna cause it to spring up all the time. And also another problem with this, if you wanted to maybe just focus it on that end where you want to take the material off, yeah, you can do that. But then what you're gonna do once you get to this point, basically what I'm saying is, 
don't get one of these because I see loads of people buy these for this job and I just don't want to see what's happening on the other side. So to get rid of the bow in this timber to make sure we get rid of all that tension in there as well, we need to make sure that we're using light pressure when we're pressing down on top of this machine to make sure we're not pressing that bow out as we send it over the cutter because it's just gonna spring back up. Now by light pressure, obviously not too light, you want to hold the material down. You need to kind of find that balance for yourself. So having something grippy like this does help, but for me, I prefer not to use these because I don't like being that far away from the timber. I like actually having my hands on it and I feel sort of more in tune with what's happening here as opposed to having two bits of plastic between me and the cutting action. So let's get this set up for a pass. Move the fence in to make sure we're not exposing too much of that cutter block. I'll have about 10 millimeters either side. It's usually quite a nice amount. And then we'll move this in, make sure it's low and tilt it to make sure there's an even amount of space on the front and back edge. Cool, there we go. So that will pass under there very easily, but there's no room for my fingers. So I want you to watch carefully when I'm doing this because not only am I gonna put light pressure on this timber, but when I put it through, as soon as I have enough material to get my hand on it on this outfeed bed, that's where all of my pressure is gonna be focused from that point because that will also help you to get that bow out of the timber. If you're pressing it down this side, then you're pressing more of it into the cutter block. Whereas you press it this side and you're gonna force that jointer to take off all the high points from underneath. I'll explain that a bit later. So let's take a cut and you can see what I'm doing here. So you see there that pressure was mostly on the outfeed bed and that ensures that you're not gonna get any sort of bow in here. Um, you didn't see it on camera, but obviously ear defenders, goggles and musts as well. Yeah, let me explain to you what is happening with the cutter block and the outfeed table. So if you're looking down the length of the cutter block, infeed bed, outfeed bed, and to adjust the depth of cut on this machine, what we do is lower the infeed bed. So I'll do that for you now so you can see what's going on. So it's moving back and it is moving down. Now this machine will take off a maximum of four millimeters while jointing wood on this top surface, but I really would not recommend taking off four millimeters. Like one millimeter is usually all I take off at a time because then you're not getting too much vibration. It's gonna prolong the cutters and you're gonna get a better finish from it as well. So about one millimeter, maybe 1.5 if you really want, but yeah, four millimeters is massively excessive. So that infeed bed is now lowered and you'll see as I try and press it forward, that's how much of the material the cutter block's gonna remove. But look at this, if you keep going, it also hits the outfeed bed there as well. And this is because the height of the outfeed bed needs to be pretty much exactly the same as the peak of the rotation of this cutter block. It needs to be as close as possible and if anything, a tiny bit lower. If it's too high in relation to the cutter block, by the time you've jointed off that material, it's gonna hit that back edge because it's not gonna be able to step up and reach that outfeed bed. And if the outfeed bed is too low in comparison to the cutter block, what it's gonna do is as the material gets off the end of the infeed bed here, it's gonna lose the support it's got from this side and it's going to drop down the amount that this table is lower than the peak of the rotation. So if this table is lower than the cutter block by one millimeter, this material is going to drop down one millimeter and you're going to get what we call snipe, which is a scoop out the end of your material like that. So all of this area below would be waste after it has dropped off. So the way that I like to check this, which is very low budget, but it works very well, is with just a little scrap of timber like this. This bottom face needs to be perfectly flat on here. And what you're gonna do is on the edge here, do two lines that are five millimeters apart. So there we go, hopefully you can see that on there. So we're gonna put the first line on the edge of the outfeed bed like that. And then with the machine fully isolated, so it's not gonna turn on, turn that cutter block very gently and what you'll see here is it picks up that timber and it's gonna carry it. Now, you see that? It's going beyond that five millimeter line, way beyond it, and it's just dropped it down there. So we'll put a little line there. Now that means that this outfeed bed is too low in comparison to the cutter block. So on the back here, I've got a knob that I can use to adjust the height of that outfeed bed. So I'm gonna move the little locking bolt on here because once you set this outfeed table, you don't need to move it again. In theory, it should stay exactly where it is once you've locked it down. 
So I'm going to keep messing around with the height of that knob on the back till I get this material to be carried to the correct distance. So I've gone the wrong way there. <laughs> There we go, that's good enough. About five or six mil works for me. So once you've sorted that out and got the outfeed bed correct in relation to the cutter block, you also need to check along the entire length of the block as well. In the case of this helical cutter that I've got on here, you don't actually need to do that because all of those little cutters are all locked into place at exactly the same height. Whereas if you're using a standard knife block in here, you need to make sure that that knife in there is parallel to the beds as well because they're on springs underneath so you need to make sure that one end of that knife isn't poking out too far because then this little block trick is going to be correct on one side of the planer but then on the other side it's going to carry it up way too high and you're just going to end up getting tapered bits of material all the time so yeah once you've sorted out that outfeed bed make sure all the knives are perfectly parallel along the width of the cutter block as well the other thing you need to check which i'm not going to do on this machine is make sure that the beds are co-planar as well which means that you need to make sure that the infeed bed and the outfeed bed are all in line with each other. They're not twisting or anything. They're not bowed forwards and backwards or anything like that. It's a bit of a job to sort out. I've never had to do it with a machine, so I'm not gonna try and do it on this one. But if you need to do that on your machine, have a look at Mark Spagnolo's video on how to do it. I'll put a link to it in the top corner. It's quite a job, I warn you. Now, another thing to look out for when you're using this machine is as you're pushing the material over, we've already stressed the importance of putting pressure on this outfeed table here to make sure you don't bow it whatsoever. But sometimes the material gets a little bit it's sticky on there and it's difficult to push it forward so the tendency is to put your hand here to give yourself a little bit of purchase to push it through but yeah you can see what's going to happen there might not be a problem on something this thick but what you need to bear in mind is that every time you pass this over the planer you're making it thinner and your hand is getting closer and closer to that cutter block so if you're getting into the swing of things and you're just passing it through pushing it from behind like that at some point in your life you're going to end up getting rid of that bit of your hand so to stop this from happening get yourself some candle wax that you just scribble over both of these beds because that will reduce the friction or you can get yourself some machine wax like this just paste it on the tables like that and this is going to make them lubricated so it's easy to push the wood over them and it's also going to protect against rust so i'll put a link to this stuff in the description i put it on my bandsaw and jointer and thicknesser all the time because it happens with the thicknesser as well as you push a material through it sometimes the feed rollers don't quite have enough purchase to pull it through because there's too much friction on the bed below so having some of this stuff on there makes it a lot easier. So now that's nice and slick, what about edge jointing? So we'll move the fence forward, as I said earlier, and we'll get the edge of the board up like that. Now, what you can't do at this point is have the guard above the timber because it doesn't go that high and you've got all that space below. So the only option we have for this is to set the machine up like this, which means that when you turn the machine on, you do have some of the cutter block exposed there, so be careful of this. So good practice when using this machine is to never have your hand pass over the cutter block while pressing down on the timber. So as an example, as I'm sending this through, pressure is on the infeed bed, and then as soon as I've got enough on that opposite edge, hand off the material and over onto the outfeed bed like that. You saw my other hand crossed over there as well, and we push it through like this. Again, as I said earlier, when you get to the end of the cut, sometimes it gets a bit sticky and you want to put your hand on the back edge like that. Gives you a lot of purchase, but again, you're gonna lose your knuckle this time as opposed to your palm. This is also the reason I don't like to use these push blocks because they're just they're quite awkward to use on an edge like this. Like You get quite a bit of grip, but you just, and it's just quite cumbersome really when you're trying to do something like this. I prefer to have my hands so I can just pinch them round that corner like that and press down and up against the fence as well at the same time. But of course it's entirely up to you. If you don't feel safe using your hands, use push blocks. Now the next thing to consider while jointing wood on this machine is the grain direction of the actual timber itself and the orientation that you put it over the cutter block. So if you're used to doing hand tool woodworking with hand planes and things like that, you'll be familiar with cutting with the grain and cutting against the grain. If you cut with the grain, all goes to plan, it's lovely. Whereas if you cut against the grain, you end up getting tear out, you break off edges and things like that. And it just makes the process absolutely terrible. So it's really important that we orientate this timber the correct way over this cutter block. All right, so we've got the timber face down on the bed on the edge that we want to joint. And if we look at the side grain here, you might be able to see that, I'll draw it on to make it more emphasized. It's kind of going down like this, off the bottom edge like that. It's not going straight, it's going off at an angle like that. So if you think of wood grain like, fur for example it can only be stroked one way imagine this is a cat 
or something like that. Its head would be up here, tail down here. If you stroke it that way, you're going with the fur and it curls up in your lap and it's loving life. As soon as you start stroking it from tail to head, it turns around and bites your face off. Timber is very much the same, but without the teeth and without the claws and without the purring. You can only stroke it one way, which is going to be this way. Just always think that the side grain on this is like fur. So as we're working this, we wanna go from this end to this end, which means that when I flip this end down like this, effectively the cat is now on its back, but its head is gonna be underneath here and its tail is gonna be here. So as we put it over the cutter block, the wood that is, not the cat, we're still going with that fur or grain, whatever. If I was to spin it round and go against the grain, so you can't see it now, but I'll draw it on this side. The fur is now going this way. So you see it's pointing towards the cutter block. As you plane that through like that, the cutter block's gonna hook underneath all of these bits of grain and it's gonna rip them out from underneath and you're gonna get what's called tear out. Another way for you to visualize this is with a bendy book. If I was to bend this round like this, you see that we've got the grain going up like this at an angle. So if I was to cut with the grain, or in other words, the cat's head's here and the tail is here, if we go this way, it doesn't dig in whatsoever, skims over the surface and it's nice and controlled. If you stroke the cat from the tail to the head, We'll go this way with the chisel. It's going between all of those pages, fur, grain, whatever we're calling it by this point, and it's gonna start chopping it up. And this is how you get tear out. So it does take a while to visualize it, but as you practice, it becomes very easy to identify which way the grain needs to go. As a quick reference, basically it's pointing down towards your feet. Whereas if it's pointing down away from you like that, that's going the wrong way. So we've covered safety with hand placement and guard placement and things like that. We've covered grain orientation to make sure that you get a nice clean finish and we've covered how to pass the wood over the cutter block so i'm going to put all that together now and do a quick demo for you on flattening this one edge and getting one edge square to that flat face the other thing i will mention here that i forgot to mention earlier with the push blocks these are great for giving you grip, but if you don't like using these, but you still crave to have that grip, some people will opt to put on some gloves to join their piece of timber. Not really something I would advise because all it takes is a little loose bit of material there to get caught in one of these cutter blocks and your hand goes down with it. So forgot to mention it earlier, don't wear gloves. Just put a bit of anti-friction wax on the bed. Don't take off as much material as you're jointing that edge underneath. And the other thing I have heard of before that I definitely haven't done before is just put a little bit of spit on your hands, rub it together and they get really grippy. So, I mean, just make sure you wash your hands before eating your sandwich afterwards. But it does work quite well, to be honest. It's pretty disgusting. Maybe just do it when no one's looking. But anyway, demo. So there you go, that's all there is to it. Nice flat face on there and an edge that is perfectly square to that. Both of those opposite edges are now ready to go through the thicknesser and you've got a beautiful square bit of timber. So don't be afraid of this machine. As long as you have sharp cutters in there, you're not taking off a stupid amount of material. The blades are nice and guarded and you're always aware of where your fingers are gonna be. There's not a whole lot that can go wrong with it. The only unpredictable thing you've got to look out for is if you're planing a thin bit of material and the cutter block is too aggressive for it and that material snaps. I've never had it happen before, but it's one of those things to always be aware of something that could potentially happen if you're working with thinner material, which again is a reason why I never make sure that I'm actually pressing on the timber as I'm putting it over the cutter block, because if that timber snaps, the next thing that's gonna hit that cutter block is my hand. Whereas if you're purposely putting your hand over it and avoiding it at all costs, even if that timber goes, then you're very unlikely to get your hand caught in there. So respect the machine, make sure it's well guarded, make sure it's sharp, make sure your timber's orientated the correct way and you will be laughing. So I hope you found this video useful. I'll see you in the next one.